Please take your seats quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tennis Weekly with Joel, Kim and Chris. On today's Tour Catch-Up. Sinner delivers to become world number two. Collins captures biggest career title in farewell season. And Novak Djokovic splits from coach Goran Ivanisevic. Kim, today is the 1st of April and we are here to catch up on the week in tennis at Tennis Weekly HQ. The Miami Open has come to an end with Yannick Sinner putting on the style and Danielle Collins capping a fairy tale campaign with her first ever W1000 title. Novak Djokovic has also announced a shock split from coach Goran Ivanisevic and the ATP calendar for 2025 has just been released. So we are not short of any talking points this week. And actually, I was a little bit nervous because putting the script together today, Kim, it's April 1st, it's April Fool's Day. And there are a lot of stories out there in the tennis world that it was just one big minefield. It was. It's always like trying to claw your way through treacle with all the (laughs) out there April Fool Mm. stories that come out. Um, I feel like also because today is a bank holiday in the UK, it's... It's, you know, there's a lot going on. We've had uh, the, the clocks change. We've had lots of Easter chocolate and all sorts of things. Um, but yeah, we've had all these a- April Fools on top of that. Um, I didn't realise this until today, actually, but you can only do an April Fools before midday. So it's too late for me to spring one on you, though, Joel, sadly. Well, well, well one story that is very true, is, a- is absolutely true, is uh, Chris, un- uh, sadly, is not able to record with us today because he had a tennis match earlier and he went up for a smash at the net and he missed the ball and actually hit his shin with the frame of his racket. And as a result of that, um, he's been in incredible pain and has had to go to hospital. So he's not been able uh, to join uh, the Tennis Weekly Trio uh, for our latest catch up. Mm, do I believe you, Joel? I don't. <laughs> I tried to this say that April with a straight Fools. face. I tried to say that with a straight face. No, that is that's absolute nonsense, isn't it? It's fortunately a lie because Chris uh, is hopefully not in pain and he is fine. Um, He's actually in Estoril for the tennis. So he's uh, hopefully having a lovely time in Portugal. Uh, Although I think they've had a bit of, you know, rubbish weather when they thought it was going to be um, nice. But we'll be hearing from Chris and Alina later on. Um, I have to say, though, Joel... There was an April Fool's joke which got me earlier and I was hoping that it, in a way it was going to be true. And that was that Roger Federer was joining Novak Djokovic's coaching team. Ooh. Can you imagine how cool that would be if it was actually real? That would be, real? Oh, that would be oh, like <laughs> polar opposites. How would the fans, how would the fandoms react to such, to such news? I mean, imagine if it was true, yeah. It's like someone defecting to another political party. It's like the dark. It's like Star Wars. It feels like Star Wars. It feels like <laughs> joining the dark. You know, the dark side. Oh dear. Um, but yeah, it is not true. It is not happening. Uh, so if, I'm sure some of our is, listeners is may Nadal also joining seen that one. Uh, the Djokovic coaching team instead. <laughs> well, no, I, I would hope not. But you know. <laughs> Who will be joining the Djokovic's coaching team? Because he is out of out of a coach, uh, which we'll get onto later on. Um, but yeah, what 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 did you what what's grabbed your attention this past week, Joel? You know, out of the, the true things that have happened, and not the not the jokes. Well, one thing that has grabbed my attention is something actually we were speaking about before recording, which I want to talk about in a sec. Was your your tennis dream, uh, which is another pure fantasy story but um in actually in the actual real world um it is a story involving roger federer and it was um him announcing earlier this week that he is delivering the commencement speech to dartmouth uh, university dartmouth university um students which i thought was very interesting because i was always wondering like what would roger federer say what pearls of wisdom would he offer uh graduation students and uh, I would have loved to have him at my, my graduation ceremony. I might look up his rates as a motivational speaker and see <laughs> if he think wants we to come and do something it? at my work. Can, can Tennis Weekly bank, bankroll it? Well, I don't know. I mean, my, my regular job, I work for a charity. So maybe he might go like pro bono oh, okay. for us. Yeah, I can Perhaps. see that. I, I don't can know. see that. Um, well, I feel yeah, like, I mean, quite, I, quite I went cool. to university in Edinburgh. So I feel like Andy Murray is a more likely candidate maybe to give a... Uh, 
a commencement speech uh, in in Scotland. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd love to know what what well, well I guess we'll we'll find out what what Mr. Federer has to say. But um, yeah, I mean, is it going to be to do with tennis? Is he going to be talking about you know maybe he's in my head anyway. Maybe he's nervous about the uh, the possible uh, dearth of of single handed backhands on the tour. So maybe his advice that he will pass on uh, to any uh, of of the class will be make sure you play with a single handed backhand. If you ever find yourself on a tennis court, and and maybe reaching the the ATP tour, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it will be along the lines of in pursuit of greatness or what have you. That was mm. the Rolex slogan for many years, wasn't it? Um, but yeah, Federer seems to be getting around and about quite a lot. It's quite interesting to see where, where he is, what he's up to in his retirement era. One place he wasn't was in my dream because I had a really strange dream last night, yeah, Joel, this which is, I was this is, telling I mean, you about I, earlier. I don't actually think you can <laughs> tell all of the dream uh, on the episode because it just gets so random. Because, no, because at yeah. one point it does involve Sara Irani, but and a lasagna. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to go there, and it's not anything you know weird, by the way. Well, it's weird, but it's not like um, <laughs> sort of sinister or suspicious. What was fueling um, these dreams? Was it the Easter all the Easter eggs you were eating? It might be the Easter chocolate, yeah. But basically, the main context of the dream was I was in a spectator's stand that was kind of on some sand dunes and there's a tennis match happening on the beach but that was it was the Wimbledon final but it was on a beach of course Wimbledon and it was Ka- final Katie on a beach. Balter <laughs> Katie Balter versus Serena Williams and it was kind of in the first set Katie Balter was quite close to winning it um and then you turned up Joel and you went onto the court and you had to serve for Katie Balter so oh, wow. uh, you know I then I then I woke up what was Balter um, injured did did she needed a, a replacement to to make the serve or I don't know. It didn't explain that to me in my dream. Uh, but yeah, and then so- Sarah Irani and Alessandra was kind of also in there somewhere. I feel like Alex uh, Dumanor would be fuming <laughs> that I was going on the court to do the serve instead of instead of him. Maybe. Yeah, she phoned you instead of him. But um, <laughs> yeah, that was the that was a strange dream. Um, but actually, that's got me thinking: Has any of our listeners had any weird dreams involving tennis players? Because we would love to hear them if if you have if anyone has had a really strange dream um you know a, a pc dream please but like send send them into us we'd love to uh we'd love to hear them and it would make me feel like i'm not the only one that has mm. had some strange i mean i've i've, <laughs> I've always dreams. had dreams of of making the croydon open a reality that's the dream that's the dream i still have close to my heart maybe we can make that dream a reality one day Maybe it can be a, a feature film like like Wimbledon <laughs> yes. with, with Paul Bettany. We can get him involved oh, yes. again. Top seed at the Croydon Croydon Open. <laughs> I think Colt. we should move on. Peter Cole, indeed, yes. For those of you who have watched that epic film Wimbledon, uh, they'll know who exactly who Peter <laughs> Colt is. Uh, but let's let's shall we? Let's see what happened at the actual tennis, uh, not the fantasy tennis. Uh, last week, well, over the last couple of weeks, because we have had the Miami Open, the second half of the Sunshine Double. Oh, it, it has gone on, Kim. It has gone on. Well, it at least has, has felt like it has gone on and on. I know the rain hasn't helped, but yeah. I'm almost like breathing, breathing a sigh of relief after this because of, of just how long I feel like it's gone on for. It has been, yeah, and we, we haven't done a catch up for, for a couple of weeks and it, it's been, it has been a while, but we do have two champions at the end of it, Yannick Sinner and Danielle Collins. I think one champion we expected, one we did not. Uh, let's start with the expected champion or one of the expected champions, Yannick Sinner, second seed. He won this title for the first time and is now up to world number two. So he continues his upward trajectory through the rankings picking up titles um you know he's having the most fabulous year on tour and it's you know going from strength to strength but he beat Grigor Dimitrov 6-3 6-1 to win his first Miami Open a uh, very dominant performance in the final there and you know throughout the week Sinner was you know pretty comfortable coming through um Medvedev in the semis and and then Dimitrov in the final what did you make of Yannick Sinner in Miami Joel were you you know were you blown away by him were you was he did he convince you I mean he was he was fantastic I mean the only player who gave him any sort of trouble who who took him to three sets I think was Talon Griegspor earlier in the tournament but certainly by the end of it the way he was playing against Medvedev where he just blew him away 6-1, 6-2. And then a similar sort of story against Dimitrov in the final. It just felt like regardless of how well or how in form his opponent was, 
like Dimitrov, who had who had earlier beaten Kolos Alcaraz in the tournament, Sinner has just been on another level. And that was the the story in the final, really. Dimitrov had had his moment early on in the match where he had break point, um, he had a break point opportunity, and you thought, oh, this could be a, an entertaining, really thrilling match potentially. But it just shows the ruthlessness I think that Sinner has to him. That even that one moment, the fact that he did not take it, the match just sort of, sort of slowly unraveled for him. And anything that Dimitrov was doing that was working against his opponents en route to the final, it just was not having any success against Sinner. Particularly, I noticed, coming to the net. I mean, he was coming to net on what I would say were pretty pretty reasonable, um, you know, approach shots. But, you know, Sinner's um, you know, ground strokes from the, the back of the court were, were impeccable. He was doing a lot of passing shots. His backhand was, was great. I think I saw a, a statistic where... You know, he had hit zero unforced errors in the in the second set on his backhand wing, and uh, it was a sight to behold. Yeah, and Dimitrov himself had very much been a man in form over the course of the the fortnight, beating um, Herkac, beating Alcaraz, beating mm. Zverev. You know, three top top players, and you know he'd only dropped serve I think twice in the, in the run up to the final. Yet Sinner broke him four times in in that final. He just wasn't you know Dimitrov wasn't able to live with Sinner. A Sinner just better on kind of every every uh, level really and you know absolutely the the man to beat and rightly you know rightly so he's picked up um the miami open which is his second atp masters 1000 and his third title of this year alone um and as we said earlier he's up to number two in the rankings now which is the highest for um an italian player um it's the first italian to get to that level in the rankings so yeah he's sort of ticking off all the the little milestones and you've got to think you know how soon will it be before he's at the very, very top? Well, I think one of the the things that he's going to need to focus on is taking this amazing form that he's had at the start of the year on the hard courts and translating that to, to the clay courts because as good as he has been so far, yeah, he needs to translate this now into the red dirt in the build-up to um, you know Roland Garros and the, and the French Open. And you know, given the momentum and the confidence he has, you know, he's going to have his home support as well in, in Italy. That's going to be a sight to behold. I have no reason to doubt that he's going to be able to do this. But um, I think that's going to be the big the big challenge now because you've got players like Carlos Alcaraz who I think are going to feel more at home, you know, in Europe on the clay. Alcaraz has that one victory against, uh, against it. And that's his only loss so far this year. So I think the stakes are going to get upped, but certainly he's handling it so, so well at the moment. And you mentioned Alcaraz, who did fall to Grigor, Dim- Grigor Dimitrov in the quarterfinals in Miami. A bit of a one-sided scoreline, 6-2, 6-4. It was straight sets to, to Grigor Dimitrov. I mean, what was the story of that match? Because I, I certainly didn't have that one um, you know, as a result. But it may be the other way around, Alcaraz dispatching Dimitrov with that scoreline. But Grigor Dimitrov was in fine form that day, Joel. But tell, you know, what was it that, that made Dimitrov so dangerous in that match? I mean, I think what I've noticed, particularly in that match and, and throughout the last couple of weeks, is his serve has been a force to be reckoned with. It's been so hard to, to break. Um, as, as you talked about, he'd only been broken twice up until the final and um, he's getting a lot more free points. S- something to it. It's more. It's more of a threat. Um, he's winning a lot more cheaper points, and um, it means that he can go and exert pressure on uh, you know on on the Alcaraz serve. And uh, I think Alcaraz maybe wasn't necessarily at the top of his game, and it was just a case of Dimitrov just finding that level of tennis that I think we all know he is capable of, but we just haven't seen it for you know so long and. You know, it, it was interesting to hear about the fact that, you know, through his, the majority of his career, he's been playing in the era of the big three, big four with with Andy Murray, peak Stan Wawrinka, and you do wonder if if playing to that level, yes, he might not have won the trophies or even the Grand Slams that um, you know, he might have been afforded if they if those sorts of players weren't there. But arguably, he's reaping the rewards of that at the moment because it took his game to a level that it needed to be in order to compete. And now those players are either not there anymore or they're not at the level that they were, for example, like you know Novak Djokovic. Um, I think he's just kind of carried on. He's gone about his business and um, 
it's it's now obviously a time for him to to make up where it was like a stop four or five years ago when there were just better players on the tour than him. Yeah, I mean, he's back in the top 10 now for the first time since 2018. So it's been a long time coming. Mm. Uh, you know, he did win a Masters uh, event back in 2017 in Cincinnati. He reached the uh, the final in, at the Paris Masters last year. We'll see, final here. So, and winning Brisbane, you know, which isn't a Masters, but at the start of the year. Yeah. So he's, he's had good form for the last kind of six months or so. And really, you know, going up into the top 10 again. I just, I worry that coming up against someone like Sinner in the final, you know, it's it's going to be the same scenario where Sinner's playing like the big three were back in the day and Dimitrov is always going to be the kind mm. of, you know, just missing out. Um, despite, you know, I missing totally out to think a new generation. To a new generation. He's sort of caught in that in between. But mm. I certainly think your point is valid with all that experience he's got from competing against the big three in their heyday has got to have held him in good stead. And he's certainly having a career with a lot of longevity because, you know, he's still... He's still going yeah. and he's still got, I think, a good few years yeah, he's left 32. in him. He's, he's only 32. So, which is young now. And I think also, <laughs> Nia, he got, in some regards, he got that, that monkey off his back earlier earlier this year with that trophy in Brisbane because you talk about Grigor Timitrov, that Brisbane title, it was six years, six years uh, between Brisbane and his previous title on the ATP tour. And you think about mm. the caliber of someone like Dimitrov and you think that... That is a stat that just should not be happening. You almost kind of like you almost kind of think you almost kind of think that's an April Fool's joke if if I, if I told you that, given you know given the level that he has played at. But you know maybe that's taken the edge off. You know he's got Jamie Delgado as well as his coach, who I think is is working wonders as well. And um, it's just great to see. I think because of the fact that earlier in his career you felt like he he was missing out on those opportunities just because there were so many better players above him on the tour but actually at the moment he's making the most of it yeah and talking of Jamie Delgado he was former coach to Andy Murray uh Andy Murray had a bit of a sad time of it in Miami didn't he he uh suffered a an injury um to his ankle which he's gonna have you know he's gonna be out for a while as a result of he's, he's had to withdraw from from Monte Carlo and Munich I can't believe he played um, on yeah, but yeah, he, yeah, he played on in his third round match to Thomas Machak, uh, despite having this injury, and he was almost it was only two points away from actually winning it, uh, which is remarkable. It was, I mean, That's Andy it was Murray a real, for you. It was a real heartbreaker of a match, uh, you know, not knowing the the extent of, of that injury. You know, you felt like Murray had gone to places he hadn't gone to before this season. You know, as a Murray fan, I was like, oh my god, he's won back to back matches that hasn't happened in a long, long time, and then. Against Thomas Machat, who's been a very tough customer on the tennis court, certainly over the last six to eight months, he gave a really good go. And you know, arguably, he should have, you know, he had opportunities to get that match won. But all this news about you know his injury with his leg, uh, you know, ATFL full rupture ligaments, these are not words you want to hear in Murray's, what looks like to be Murray's swan song season. Yeah. However, he has said he will obviously be doing all he can um, to sort of see what his next steps are. And I'll quote from him. Goes about saying this is a tough one to take and I'll be out for an extended period. But I'll be back with one hip and no ankle <sighs> ligaments when I'm the time nervous. is right. I'm not going to like so... him. I'm, I am nervous. The fact that there is no there is no time scale on return. They've spoken about an indefinite um, t- like mm. time frame grass court season you know coming up i think everyone is is so keen to see him have one more wimbledon this season i think you know with the the severity of the injury it sounds like that is going to be that's the aim of the game now clay season's a write-off mm. i feel like the best we can hope for now is possibly one lead up grass court event and and, and wimbledon um and you know i think with murray it's his career it's always been a, ro- a roller coaster and this season is you know no exception what you know when, when you think he's suddenly found some form something else happens and um you know we'll we'll have to wait and see I just hope that he does get his moment to come back and mm. be fit for Wimbledon but there's certainly going to be a lot of nervous Murray fans um up until that moment yeah we hope that he can come back and yeah have his kind of last hurrah at Wimbledon which I think we were kind of expecting mm. perhaps perhaps this year as well um i mean we've we had you know a stunner from sinner we've had 
Dimitrov going on a you know determined drive through the through the tournament. We've also had a bit of a rant from Casper Rude out in Miami, um, where he was moaning not like about him. the the tournament. <laughs> The cheap tournament, uh, as he's kind of called it, that the treatment of the players, the the fact that there isn't anything provided, he's not happy with how um, the players have been kind of treated. And James Blake is the tournament director, uh, so I guess he's ultimately responsible for providing, you know, facilities and things for the players. But Casper Rude is not happy with him. Uh, he had a bit of an outburst on the court in his second round match against Luca Van Asch. Um, complaining about the towel and water arrangements and calling the tournament cheap. What did you make of Casper Rude's rant? Because normally, you know, he's he's quite a nice, calm yeah, guy. Yeah, very considered but man. But this is, this is a bit unlike I, him. He must have really not liked the towels I or wondered, the lack of towels. I wondered if he there was a bit of strategy here in terms of, of, of making these complaints in this way so that it was, you know, he did it deliberately so it was kind of picked up you know, on mic so that it would get out into the news because, you know, perhaps, you know, if they had gone through like the player council and voiced objections that way, it would have been a bit more private and it would have been, been a bit more under wraps and, and maybe nothing would have been done of it. So he's kind of gone for the more uh, shoutier, <laughs> more nuclear option of kind of doing it, basically doing it public. And uh, I think it's quite interesting because you look at Miami from a, a fan's point of view and I don't, I get the feeling it's not, it's not every fan's favourite Masters event really at the moment because it moved from, you know, that those gorgeous facilities in, in Key, Key Biscayne to this, you know, to this setup where, you know, you've got like 15 courts on some tarmac and, the the stadium court is a stadium within a stadium which again it just doesn't feel and look right and you're going from t- tennis paradise which you know has had some you know had some you know challenges um you know in the first half of the sunshine swing to this i personally think there's a big there's still a big i don't want to say drop off but i certainly think there's some a, some big contrasts i think going on between the two and you know with all the rain that miami has had um over the last couple of weeks i, I do wonder kim you know we spoke i laughed it off last time but you spoke about whether roofs should be mandated at a master's level and uh you know having seen what's happened over the last two weeks in miami i would i would tend to agree yeah, I mean, we might be getting more extreme weather events as well with climate change. So perhaps the the need for them increases along with that. And I think, yeah, it's a bit of a juxtaposition between what's provided at Indian Wells versus what's provided at Miami, uh, which might might make it seem worse mm. for the players. He he basically was saying that you go to a trailer for five minutes in a room with nothing and just a plastic chair to change. He said maybe they could put some towels, maybe some cold water for the players' comfort. Um, so yeah, he's definitely spoken out. I mean, obviously, some people might say, "Well, is this a bit of a first world problem?" Mm. You know, you're getting it paid heat of the mo- lots you of money know, heat to of the moment play, as a, well. play a nice tournament. Yeah, um, but you know, fundamentally, obviously, they should be providing water and things like that for the players. I mean, I, I guess the other thing is well, Indian Wells as bankrolled by <laughs> Larry Ellison, who is like one of the most wealthy individuals in in the world. So maybe it's to be expected that Indian Wells is maybe a level above. Um, for you know, for players in terms of you know, in comparison to what what Miami Open is delivering. I mean, what's your point of view on on that move from Key Biscayne to this setup, the stadium within the stadium? I mean, the fan mm. point of view. What what do you think about that? Because I'm I'm not sure. But then at the same time, when I look at it on TV and I see those lovely um, big like sofa blue chairs uh, around the side of the court. They look very lovely, and I'm like, oh, that that looks a very comfy place to watch some tennis. Well, yeah, it probably depends how you're going and what what your <laughs> personal experience is. But yeah, I, I it's not ever been one on my list of oh, I must go to that mm. event. Whereas Indian Wells, yeah, would would be absolutely like a you know a, a kind of dream tournament, I guess, to to go to. But Miami's never really appealed in in the same way. Um, and I, you know, I feel like some of our listeners would would potentially agree with that but at the same time you know it's um i'm sure miami's a very fun place to go so if, if you're there and there's a bit of tennis then then why not but i mean they obviously had their reasons for moving from mm. one venue to, to the other um but perhaps oh i don't know i'm sure casper rude is probably 
um, wants the Saudis to to maybe invest and uh, make sure that every tournament yeah. provides the the quality of toweling and and water that he wants. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's have a look at what went on in the women's draw out in Miami, though, because we did have. Um, a win for unseeded American player Danielle Collins, uh, winning the biggest title of her career, uh, defeating Elena Rabakina, the fourth seed, in the final 7-5-6-3 on Saturday. Uh, this is kind of a dream story, really, for Danielle Collins. She's retiring this year. You know, she's she's kind of on her kind of final farewell. And yet she, here she is winning the the biggest title of her career to date. Um at kind of out of the blue, <laughs> uh, the lowest ranked champion here at 53 in the world uh, and the third lowest uh, to secure a title at this, in one of the Sunshine Double tournaments as well. Um, Joel, what did you make of Daniel Collins this week? Remarkable. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It was it was very it was very impressive. She spent very little time on court. You know, she just went about her business in a very easy non-fussy way and it's been amazing to see since you know the announcement uh that you know this season is going to be her her farewell season the fact that she's you know gone to levels of tennis that i don't think we've seen from her since you know she reached um you know the australian the australian open uh lady singles final those you know those those years ago so from that point of view it's been it's been amazing and you know to do it in your home state in florida um, you can just see how much it meant to her, you know, when she finally got over the finish line against Rabakina. She gave an incredible speech. She was making sure that she did not leave anyone out uh, when it came to, um, you know, thanking her her team and her support staff. But yeah, it's it's just been a whirlwind couple of weeks for her. And uh, you know, that final against Rabakina, you know, to me, they're players who are very aggressive, but they go about it in a very different way, you know. Collins is you know shrieking she's yelling come on um she's really in your face whereas Rebecca is obviously a lot more reserved she likes to keep a lid on things just focuses a lot more on the tennis so it was a real battle and um yeah I'm, I'm happy for Collins because you know this is this is kind of like the you know aside obviously from winning a grand slam this is probably the biggest thing that she could have done this season win a, a w1000 title and she's gone ahead and done that yeah and in the final you know rebecca was you know had lots of chances to to break uh collins coming through saving them and i think you know we know she's so sort of determined she she plays with a lot of you know feistiness and mm. saving you know multiple break points and kind of just and then edging that set really you know and then it was sort of in the second set she um you know got got managed to get the first break and away she went with it i think it just you know really gritty gritty win and you know like you said she'd kind of come through very comfortably um prior to that she played three hours less tennis getting to the final than, than rebecca which which probably helped you know she was a bit fresher i mean i mean rebecca rebecca was coming into this with you know an illness she didn't play indian wells mm. and she really had to find her kind of feet coming through just just taking one match at a time and in particular that semi-final against azarenka i would actually say probably one of the matches of the season it had everything including a, an, a bagel as well which you you don't often see um rebecca you know receiving um, so for her to come through that, yeah, she showed this week how much she is a battler and um, can come through when she's not feeling, uh, you know, a hundred percent. But um, Collins has just been, I think, just so motivated to, I think, make the most of of the time she's got left. You know, it's, it's it was interesting to hear, you know, there was inevitable talk on, and I feel like we're just going to hear this every time, you know, she does well in a in a tournament is, oh, wouldn't you consider unretiring and, and playing on given the levels you're playing? Well, actually, I think the fact that she's almost made a full stop on it already, she's being like, nope, this is going to be my final season. I think that's almost kind of taken that um, the edge off, really. She's out, able to kind of focus back on her tennis, make the most of the time she has got left, and she is delivering. I mean, she can retire and then she can always come back again in a few years' time because, you know, she said there's so much more than just tennis in her career. It's her personal choice. So this result doesn't change mm. her decision. But, you know, there's always, 
in a few years' time, she may well come back. You know, Wozniacki's back, <laughs> um, for example. So, you know, players have, have done this before. They try and come back and, you know, fair play. If they want to do that, then that's that's their decision. Um, I mean, she spoke about her health and, and the fact that, you know, this is so much more to do than just tennis and my career. Mm. And I think that's really refreshing hearing about, you know, players putting their health, you know, their health first. I think that, you know, we see some players just take it to the absolute limit and try and push their bodies as hard as possible. And you sort of wonder, okay, where's that going to leave them You know, post their career? So it's quite refreshing, I think, to hear these stories where actually someone like Danielle Collins has been like, look, I can't play tennis until I'm, I'm absolutely knackered because I don't want to... I don't want my health to be compromised in mm. my post playing career. So she's almost kind of put a full stop on it and been like, right, well let's 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 see what I've let's see what I've got left and let's see what I can do. Yeah, it's just one chapter of of her life and of her, you know, her evolution away from the game, uh, as Serena put it. But um yeah, one player that you know, has very recently returned to the tour, obviously was out out of, you know, I guess not not her choice. Simona Halep, uh, she was back in Miami. She was given a wild card. Uh, she did lose to Paola Badosa in her first match in, in three sets. Uh, but that was her first match uh, in, in, a, in a long time. And uh, there was a bit of, you know, a bit of debate, I think, amongst other players, perhaps, about whether she should have been getting that wild card. Caroline Wozniacki made some comments to say that she doesn't think players who are banned for doping should get wild cards on their return. Um, she doesn't think it's fair. Um, do, you, do you agree with Wozniacki's comments there, Joel? Do you think she has a point? I certainly think she's got a point from the position of the fact that Halep wasn't, she wasn't totally cleared. You know, she still had a ban uh, in, in place and she had served that ban and she had come back. But it wasn't like she was completely off kind of scot-free um, and it was back on the tour and it was a mistake and it wasn't it wasn't like that. And I can see from that point of view that it feels a bit for tournaments and tournament organisers to hand out wild cards to players who again in this in this circumstance where the the player has ultimately has has served a ban that is a that is a fact does that feel right and for some players that is not gonna you know sit well and of course Simona Halep can come back to the tour but it feels like they're obviously getting a helping hand and should they be afforded that helping hand I'm I'm still on the fence about it but I can certainly see why Caroline Wozniacki thinks no if you you did that and you've served your time fine but you've got to make your way back up to wherever it is without anyone else's help because you know you've got yourself into this position and it's not like you're completely guilt-free given the given you know what was ultimately handed to her I shall look forward to the, their first match, Hallett versus Wozniacki, <laughs> when that's in the draw mm. sheet, that's for sure. I mean, one player as well, um, a bit of a shock result, uh, that's Iga Svantec. Uh, we thought, you know, she might have a difficult match perhaps against Linda Noskova, which, I mean, it I was a three-setter. I had Noskova three -setter. winning that, and I was, and I was sort of licking my lips uh, about, <laughs> I was sort of drafting my WhatsApp message to Chris being like oh i told you so and and, and all of that but it was sadly uh, yeah just out just out of reach but yeah next round alexandrova yeah Svantec losing in straight set 6-4-6-2 to uh alexandrova who was the 14th seed i did not see this one coming uh i have to say you did know anyone yeah well did anyone it, i mean alexandrova had beaten Svantec before she beat her back in 2021 in Melbourne, but Shrontek had won all their matches since. But Alexandra, I mean, she was she was in in fine form. This, you know, arguably is her the best win of her, of her career. Completely outplayed Shrontek, um, giving her no chance to try and you know capture the the sunshine double, um, and did back it up. To be fair, with a win over Pagula as well in the in the following round, but then ultimately falling to to Danielle Collins in the semi finals. But what what do you think it was about Alexandra on that day and in, in her performance that Shvontek had such trouble with? I think it's a very interesting question. I think a lot of of the a lot of players who who've got Iker Shvontek uh, in in their draw will be looking at the, at this match and thinking about what are the strategies I can take from this and employ in my match against um, Iker Shvontek. And I think when you look at Alexandra's game, it was very much built on first strike tennis, getting a hold of the rally. I like the way she was stepping up to serve. 
um, to Iga Swiatek's serve and you know really trying to impose herself. I think you've got to make Swiatek doubt herself and have mind games with herself. I think that's when you can kind of get her a little bit unstuck. And when you have like the power to to hit flat and aggressive from the back of the court um, with the ball sitting low. I think that really kind of helps you. And I think we've seen that before in some of the, you know, Shiontek's recent defeats, those sorts of players, you know, like a Rabakina or a Sabalenka, when that kind of ball comes to you, the contact position with Shiontek, you know, she likes to hit a bit more loopy with her forehand, a little bit more spin. When it comes in flat and low to her, um, it's a little bit of a, a different proposition. So I think those things helped her. I also think having variety helps um, in terms of, you know, Shiontek, she is a great mover on the on the tennis court. But I think if you can disguise your shots and keep your opponent second guessing, it doesn't matter how good your movement is because you might not be sure where, where it's going to go. Is it a drop shot? Is it going to be a cross court shot? Is it going to be down the line? And I think, again, having that disguise on your shots can help create that doubt um, in in Shiontek's mind in terms of what's what's coming up and I think that's I think from that match that's the key is is you want to make Shiontek doubt herself and I think there are plenty of ways to do that yeah well she'll be hoping to better herself in the next tournament you know she'll want to do better than than the fourth round but she's going on to the clay next uh, which we know that Shiontek mm. thrives on the clay especially so I'm sure she won't be down for too long Uh, But let's take a very quick break now uh, after we've just discussed all of Miami. Uh, We'll be back in the second half to look at Novak Djokovic splitting with his longtime coach, Goran Ivanovic. Uh, The ATP 2025 calendar being announced. And Chris will also be joining us from the Estoril Open. So do not go anywhere. Welcome back to the Tennis Weekly Podcast. And now we're going to move on to a little quiz section to kickstart the second half. Joel, you've got a par for the courts for myself, I believe, and our listeners. Yes, I do. This is a par for the courts solo edition for you, Kim, and our listeners. And uh, I think it's quite tricky. I actually road tested this on my friend earlier in the week and they did not get above 50%. So I'm, I'm giving you that as a benchmark now, as a, as a word of warning. Okay. Okay. Ooh, how difficult is this, Joel? <laughs> <laughs> right. My question for you and our listeners is this. As of the 18th of March, 2024, I, put, I made this earlier in the week, hence the date. Um, as of 18th of March, 2024, there are 11 men in the ATP top 100 ranking with the name Alex or a foreign equivalent of Alex in their home country who are they so I just oh, right that's so interesting so I, I'm just gonna repeat oh, that you get that from? I'm just gonna repeat that for you as of the 18th of March 2024 there are 11 men in the ATP top 100 ranking with the name Alex or a foreign equivalent of Alex in their home country who are are okay. they and i okay. am gonna set par score so there's 11 i'm gonna say above 50 percent. i think this is quite tough so i'm gonna say i'm gonna say six out of 11 i think i'm okay. being generous i think i'm being generous yeah. there because i'm looking at some of these names and there are some names i'm like these are absolute gimmies but there are also mm. some names in there i'll be like kim I'm, i will be very impressed if you if you get them Okay, right. Let's do this. I, I have a few already <laughs> that I'm thinking of, so at least I okay. won't have zero. Okay, so <laughs> uh, Alexander Zverev to begin with. That is correct. Yes, he is the highest ranking Alex uh, Zverev. Uh, highest ranking Alex Zverev. He is the highest ranking Alex <laughs> in the uh, top 180. There's rankings. only one of him, fortunately. <laughs> um, Alexander Bublik. That is correct. Yes. So you've got you've got two correct answers. Yep. To Alexander Bublik, Alexander Zverev, Alejandro Tabilo. Very good. Yes. Yes. Tabilo <laughs> is on the list. So that's three correct answers. So I need to think of Alex's that 
a like Alejandro kind of mm-hmm. in their other yeah, language. There's or... other there's other ones as well. Um, but yes, you're you're on the right track. Uh, uh, Alexi, oh Alexi Popperin. Very good. Yes, Alexi Popperin is on the list. So that is um, four. I'm just not, trying to think of not far what it away, might be. Kim, from Ale- uh, Alexi. Alex not far away Tra- from par for the courts here. Alejandro, Alejandro Fire, but he's retired, isn't he? Um, oh, um, Alex, I think it's Alexander, Alexander Shevchenko. That is correct. Alexander Shevchenko is on the list. So that is five answers, Kim, that are correct. You need one more to make par for the courts this week. One more. I definitely wouldn't be able to get 11. Um, I'm really scratching my brains now. Um, Oh, um, he's he's Slovakian, I think, but he's got a standard Alex name. Um, Alex Molkan? Alex Molkan? It's incorrect, Kim. <laughs> he oh, is no. outside the top 100. Oh. He is. He was 147 in the rankings. He's definitely a, a top 100, top 50, top, I don't know, top 30 player on his day. But um, yeah, he is not in the rankings in the top 100 at the moment. So unfortunately, I have to say you have not achieved par for the courts this week. Oh, that's not unexpected. <laughs> but what are the other Alexes then? You're not going to say it's like Alex Alcaraz. He's just changed his name. Well, or Kim, I'm some, not going to lie. There is, a, there is a big name you have missed. Oh, a big, really? big name. And I actually said his name earlier in the episode. It is Alex de Menor. Oh, Alex de Menor. Alex de Menor <laughs> is one of the answers oh, you could have had. Of course. Um, of he course. was the second highest ranking Alex. Uh, so Zverev, de Menor. He's obvious, isn't he? Alexander really? Bublik, Alejandro Tabillo. Another Alejandro that you could have possibly got. Davidovich Fakina. Oh, Fakina. ADF. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Popperin, Shevchenko. And then the, the final four... Um, I will be impressed, listeners, if uh, special bonus points to you if you get any of these. Alexander Vukic. Oh, yeah. The American Alex Mickelson. Mm. The Frenchman Alexandre Muller. Oh, of course. And uh, just sneaking in into the top 100, uh, another American, Alexander Kovacevic. Uh, gosh, you could have a little tournament so just with Alex. There you go. You? <laughs> there you go. I mean, maybe we should. I, I love that. And and Alex, an ATP Alex Battle Royale. That would be a a, a sight to see. I, I mean, who, who, yeah. Well, eleven percent of the top hundred tennis players are Alex, so it's a good name <laughs> for your kids. I think. So uh, there you if go. You want them to grow up playing tennis. Zverev, Dimonor, Bublik, Tabio, Davidovich, Fakina, Popperin, Shevchenko, Vukic, Mikkelsen, Muller, and Kovacevic. Listeners, let us know. Let us know how you did in that part of the court solo edition. Uh, I was wondering. I was thinking, is 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 Ugo some kind of French equivalent for Alex? <laughs> but no, it's it's Alexandre, of course. Um, but no, thank you, Joel. Thank you very much, listeners. Let us know uh, how you got on. Did you beat me? Did you get the obvious Alex de Menor? Um, like unlike me but there we go um let's have a look at what's in our mailbag now uh because we've actually got as a novelty we've got chris sending in a mailbag question chris is out in Asteril. i know um but yeah he's not he's not you know on the pod so he's allowed to be uh, a listener with a mailbag question today but yeah he sent in his question so let's have a little listen now Hello, Joel and Kim. You'll be hearing from me later, but now it's time for a mailbag with a difference. I'm here in Estoril, and I want to put the question to you, with Estoril potentially being cancelled next year and more and more 250s being downgraded with more focus on 1,000 and 500 tournaments, is this a positive thing for the ATP and WTA Tour or is this something that we should be sad about and then we should try and make sure that these 250 tournaments and smaller tournaments keep their places on the calendar? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question about Estoril because the ATP 2025 calendar has just been announced. Estoril is not on it and it just 
feels like we are getting to a point where there's been a lot more focus on the 1000s and the 500s the fact the 1000s are all becoming these these two week events yeah it feels like they are becoming a lot more you know significant and because of that you know there's got to be something that gives way somewhere and it does feel like some of those 250s are you know giving way i think you know newport as well in the grass season is another one that you know is is being a race which is which is a shame um i think i think it's tough because i think you know these 250 events some of them just have so much heritage and prestige that goes beyond i think the sort of the ranking points that are like on offer and as a result of that i'm kind of like i think they should stay because you know they they are they are great tournaments i see the fans there they absolutely love it and you know i think more tournaments to me and spreading the the game of tennis globally is is very important and i would arguably say more important than than doubling down on your your biggest events i get it from a point of business and and we know those work and are most appealing but i also think from a player point of view like you know what happens to those players who maybe can't get into a an, a thousands draw or a, or a 500 draw you know we've spoken about how stacked some of those 500 draws are you know like rotterdam for example um i feel like you need the 250 events for you know for some of these players to make sure that they can make a living and, and play apply themselves on the tour you know 12 months of the season so i would personally think there maybe needs to be a bit more of a balance and at the moment it feels like we're not really getting that balance you know looking at the 2025 calendar and there's a lot more focus on just what it works right at the top rather than thinking about what's at the bottom as well yeah ideally you'd have something for everyone and that's different level of of players at different rankings as well as fans you know one of the tournaments that is um going from next year is the hall of fame open which is um the the grass court event out in newport which you know i've, I've not been to the the tenant the tournament there but i've been to the hall of fame i've seen like the setup and it's it's so cute it's very quaint it's mm. very historic and i love that sort of those sorts of tournaments and they sort of seem to be getting yeah shunted aside for these kind of big uh, money earners and i get it you you know from a business perspective that that may make more sense but i think it is a real shame when you get some very historic events um that you know have have you know people have great memories there the players love them and they're just not going to be an option um although for esteril there is um a bit of a, a possibility that it is going to remain because it is a very you know highly um regarded event um they've basically <sighs> The ATP have, have announced that the Estoril event does not hold an ATP membership, but has operated under an ATP license for the last kind of nine years. So they are working at ways of, of perhaps continuing this this event. Um, so th- it's not the end of the world yet for for Estoril Open, but um, yeah, it is a shame that we're going to lose some of the the nice two fifties yeah. that you know. There's definitely a place for them. It feels like there's like a they have like a novelty element about them that you don't yeah. necessarily get. I think with all the big events, and I think the worry again, one of the worries might be is if you get rid of these two fifties, like you know, where are the lead up events? You know, it feels it's all serious all of the time with you know, ranking points on the line, etc. The you know the thousands and the five hundreds, and you know, you, you know, players need to play into form as well, and I think you need to allow like flexibility in the schedule and if you get rid of this this bottom tier or or shorten it or even dissolve it you're sort of removing that flexibility and you're expecting players just to go from big event to big event perform at their best level and i don't necessarily think it it always works like that also there's going to be 16 500 level tournaments but six of them are going to be in february which seems a bit unbalanced uh so i'm not sure if that's the wisest move but you know We'll have to see what happens when it's when it's all played out. At least we have a schedule to talk about uh, on the ATP side because I don't know where or when that WTA schedule is going to be coming out. Yeah, and people need to plan their year. So <laughs> uh, coaches, fans, players, everyone needs to know. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll wait eagerly for the WTA version. Um, 
What else has been in the news, though, recently, Joel? Because we've had some news from Team Djokovic, uh, and that is that Goran Ivanisevic uh, is no longer working with Djokovic. Uh, he was brought on in 2018 um, to, to join Djokovic's team um, and became his main kind of full-time single coach in, in 2022. They've won 12 slams together. They've been very successful, but it has come to the time where he is uh, no longer going to be involved. Uh, what do you make of this, Joel? Does, do you think this ex- might explain Djokovic's kind of disappointing start to the year? Things weren't going so well in their relationship, perhaps? I think it's a result of the fact that things haven't been going well. And even someone like Novak Djokovic, who has a- achieved so much in the game, he 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 still needs to evaluate things and assess things and, and, and change things. And I think he's got to a point where, you know, the Ivanisevic in his camp has worked and been so successful over a long period of time, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's right. And I think all good things come to an end. I think we saw that you know, previously with, you know, someone like Marin Vida in his team, who again achieved similar amounts of crazy levels of success. And we sort of, I think a little bit on a, on a, on a repeat. And I'll be fascinated to see what, you know, Djokovic does now because of the success he's had, you know, with Ivan Isevich in his corner. But um, it, although it feels kind of shocking at the same time, given, you know, his form and what's been happening over the last six months or so, I think he's been right to be like, right, I need to, I need to stir the pot here. I need to think about, you know, how I can change things up because whatever's going on at the moment, it's quite clear, it's quite clear that it's not working. Who would you recommend Djokovic brings in? Is there anyone you have in mind? Well, not not Roger Federer, I, of course. I I personally would see if Marion Vida would would take my take my phone call. I think I think you know they he knows that uh, that relationship uh, was very successful, um, and you know they know that they can work with each other. I know, so so I I, I think he can he can go back there if 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 you know they still get on and. You know, they can still you know work together um so for me i personally would maybe go go back back into the well um of, of previous coaches and maybe go with someone like a marion vider marion vider was uh, funnily enough i think coaching alex molkan yes. wasn't he but yes. now that alex molkan is out the top 100 maybe mm. that maybe that isn't the thing anymore <laughs> yeah i think as i say i think to me that happened time has passed Time heals all wounds potentially, and uh, it's time to get maybe Marion Vider back in because if he has ambitions of going on and on to reaching, I don't know, thirty Grand Slam singles titles, for example, he wants he's going to need a a consistent, you know, support team and stability, and he just doesn't have that. You know, it feels you know at the moment you know, he got rid of Vider, he's got rid of Ivanisevic, he got what he got rid of also a long term someone in in his in his his team as well uh you know last season so yeah I think he needs stability and I think he needs to go back to yeah someone he knows that he can work with Mm, well we'll watch this space uh he did say that uh we will be informed in if someone joins the team so so that's very nice of him thank you (laughs) Uh, but anyway we are on to the clay swing now uh Miami is over sunshine double has ended we have a plethora of clay court events happening we've got Charleston out in uh, the States, which is the WTA green 500 clay. event. Green clay. There's I know not you love enough a bit green, green clay, clay on tour. I say this every year on the podcast. Not enough green clay events. <laughs> well, who's going to win this one? Pagula is the top seed there and uh, Onshabur is the second seed. Be interesting to see how Danielle Collins does because she's in the draw. She's got Paola Badosa first round. Yeah, so night, could be nightmare draw. Nightmare draw, first round, Collins, Badosa. And then the winner plays the second seed, Onshabur. It's quite a quick turnaround, though, isn't it, to go on to the the clay, mm. albeit green, from from winning Miami. So, I, yeah, I'm not. I won't have too high expectations of, of Collins, but obviously, I'd love her to continue her. I run think Chris, form. if if Chris was seeing this draw right now, I think he would be seeing Maya Sharif in in a 500 draw. What's what's that about? It's not a it's not a WTA <laughs> one two five. Oh, well, well, well. Let's hope <laughs> Maya Sharif can prove him wrong. Uh, we've also got out in uh, Houston, we've got the men's uh, ATP 250, where Ben Shelton is uh, headlining this one. Francisco Serendolo is the second seed. 
Uh, so we have that one taking place. We've got the Bogota Open, which is WTA. This is the mm. one that uh, Tatiana Maria has won, I think, for the last two yeah, years. Did she make it a hat trick? So can, yeah, can she make it a hat trick? That would be quite hat trick. I know. And it's amazing. I mean, Fran Jones, GB Fran Jones is in there as well. So some British interests. But um, yeah, I feel like all eyes on Tatiana Maria because she, she just seems to play out of her skin there. I mean, it, the, the, the conditions that there are so unique, I think, because of the you know the sea level and uh, how sorry how high it is above sea level that it's it's almost anyone's it's it's anyone's game i think in the draw <laughs> um we have the atp event in marrakesh this is a 250 uh Lash Leger is the top seed although my eyes are drawn to uh a match uh alexander vukic versus alexandre oh. muller battle of the alexes love it love it <laughs> And Alexander Shevchenko is also mm, there. <laughs> a Berrettini as well on a, on a protective ranking against uh, Shevchenko. So, yeah, I'm interested to see how he gets on uh, gets on there. I mean, Nagal as well. Always love a bit of Indian tennis game from strength to strength at the moment. So, uh, love to see how Nagal uh, gets on. And, uh, yeah, Dan Evans is the third seed. So, again, some more GB interest. I'm only interested in players called Alex now, Joel. So the others uh, don't matter Lash at all. Lange Leger, top seed. I, I feel like that takes some getting used to. Is he a top seed type player? I, I'm not sure. Oh, he's going to go and win Marrakesh. Yeah, he probably uh, is Without now. dropping yeah, a set he probably, now. He's now you probably just that. heard that. And uh, yeah, he's going to go prove me wrong. Uh, and finally, we've got Estoril, which is 250. This might be the last rendition of the tournament. Uh, let's hope not. But if it is, Chris will be there with Alina to capture all of the magic that takes place. Uh, we do have uh, a little uh, clip of both of them. So let's have a little, little listen to them now and see what they've been getting up to in Estoril so far. Thank you, Joel and Kim. And even though I haven't been able to listen to it yet because we are recording this live, I'm sure it's been a wonderful episode without me. But I'm joined here with Alina, who promised us that the next time that we would hear from her would be at a clay tournament in a warm country. And she delivers. We're going to Estoril. Uh, everything was set and ready for a clay tournament in a warm country. But little did we know, Chris, that we're going into some rain and floods. Have you seen what's going on in Iberia lately? It looks biblical. The amount of water running down the streets, you would think it was a fully flowing river. So we thought we were getting some wonderful spring sunshine. As we're both based in Copenhagen, we thought it would be a lovely opportunity to catch a tan, enjoy some tennis. And to be honest, we might be catching a lot of rain delays and a lot of grey skies. Exactly. Pack the umbrellas and the raincoats. Here we go. It'll just be like a Wimbledon rain delay. But yes, we are going to Estoril and the draw is pretty stacked. It's a great draw for a 250. It's headlined by the defending champion Casper Ruud and also featuring another top 10 seed in the form of her catch who will be playing. We have familiar names playing in Estoril as well. We have Monfils, Fis, Massetti and Dominic Team. And Alina, we have to touch upon it. You did send me an announcement video from Dominic Team. Actually, once I saw it coming, popping on the socials, I was like, what is going on? Is he retiring? What is all this drama? The set, everything was like alarms. And he was very serious talking about the rumors that were going on and he needs to utilize his platforms to set the record straight. I'm like, what rumors? And we were like, what did we miss? Uh What's going on? And I honestly could not breathe for the entirety of the first part. I thought, honestly, he's going to retire and just like dropping the news. I was like, is this it? It was in multiple language with multiple different cameras set up. And I was thinking, so good news, not retiring. Then I kept listening. Will he be in Estoril? He said yes. So for me, it was confirmation that he will be there. But that was kind of all it was. It was an RSVP to, to Estoril. So... We will be seeing him there. We will hopefully be speaking to him there. Let's hope we can actually ask him what was behind the big What production? was the announcement? And can we get yeah. some of your production crew to help us on the podcast? We'll need to make sure that maybe we bring multiple <laughs> camera angles. You can bring multiple languages, that's for sure. I'm not sure that I can. But the qualifiers have kicked off. But there's been some notable names already in the qualifying, Alina. Yeah, we had uh, the Frenchies uh, participating. We had Luca Pui and uh, Richard Gasquet, who I think he just finished his match. A victory for Gasquet indeed. So 
as well as the Frenchies, it's all about the Portuguese at this tournament. And most notably, there is the home hope, probably the best hope of picking up um, some wins here in Nuno Borges. We also have some slightly sad news, but potentially a great story in the fact that Joao Sosa is actually playing his last tournament and retiring here, as well as the fact it is Estoril potentially... Well, you can maybe clear this up. Is it the last year of Estoril as well? So much speculation went on around this. I think we touched upon it last year and we were like, okay, if this is going on, we must be there. You said we book need... a flight, we're going. This is a destination you have to go to on the tour. Yeah, and the speculation went around and the officials of the tournament uh, denied the rumors until the very last moment. And boop, we had an ATP calendar coming up that actually told us the truth it we didn't might feature seeing... it we'll yeah. try and find out more um but hopefully there will be a spot at some point in the future but it is a wonderful tournament we're very very excited for it and we have mentioned before for all of our listeners we'll know you're partial to an argentinian it's a bit slim pickings over in portugal but there's a couple of people who've made the trip tell us about them and tell us about who you think will have the best run well we have fede cordia who is having a run again I think that might be exciting to see. He's a very thirsty player. He was in really good good form in, in Buenos Aires. And the other Argentino that I can see in the draw... Is Pedro... How do I say Pedro this? Pedro Am I saying it right? Pedro oh, Cachin. Cachin. Yes. 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 He has different names depending on the country he's in, I think. Yes. And depending yeah. on whether Joel came or I are saying it. Or yourself, definitely. But... Again, that's another Argentinian for you to kind of keep your attention on the tournament. I will be heading early. I'm flying during what seems to be uh, a hurricane (laughs) over in a severe (laughs) weather warning. So let's hope that the flight does get there. But you'll be joining me, I'm sure, for a pastel de nata courtside from Estoril. And we'll be keeping you posted. So safe flight and do we know how i say see you in the future in portuguese i don't know we will have to figure ourselves we will uh, figure it out and if anyone's going to figure it out it will be you alina so we'll leave you for goodbyes with joel and kim it's interesting about dominic team um this big announcement they were worrying that oh he's going to retire but actually what it was is that dominic team has announced he's going to be training with less intensity because he has had a flare-up of that that wrist injury that you know was obviously has been career altering for him uh so sensible decision from his part and actually he has won today uh so he's won his first match um at estoril against Montera. um Martyra, Maximilian Martyra. So in three sets. Uh, but yeah, he's through to the second round. So it's a nice kind of opening win for Dominic Team, And perhaps taking that kind of step back in terms of his training will actually, you know, hopefully benefit him. But we'll see. We will see. I just I just hope, because Kasper Rood is the top seed here, I hope that the towel facilities are, are up to scratch in, in Estoril, or at least maybe a little bit better than Miami. Well, let's hope. Let's hope the Estoril <laughs> Open have upped their towel game. You know, <laughs> maybe that should be factored into the ATP calendar. Mm. Does the tournament provide nice towels? Yes. If so, you can stay. <laughs> uh, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, well, well, Chris can bring us all the towel uh, towel gossip uh, mm. next week when he's back uh, with us are you, are to you, catch up. <laughs> are you are you thinking Casper Rude? Is he going back to two fifties and and is gonna sort of walk walk this tournament? Is that the is that the feeling? I'm. I'm thinking Gail Monfils, perhaps. Okay. Interesting. I know it's Clay, but he's you know he's been getting a few good wins lately. I I don't know. Uh, or maybe Massetti. Or oh, maybe Herkash. No. <laughs> is there any Alexes in the draw? Uh, D- no. Vidovic so. is there? Oh, in, in ADF. Seed. There yep. we go. Yep. There we go. I remember him actually playing at this event. I went to it in 2019, and I th- it's the first time I saw ADF was at Estoril. So yeah. Uh, maybe maybe it'll be his. I his I week. Joe, I had a, I have a random ADF memory actually. I watched him in Queens qualifying. Um, they used to. I don't think they do it anymore. I'm not sure. Um, they used to just open up the grounds for Queens qualifying mm. on the weekends, and I remember watching ADF um, on the on the outside courts. And uh, yeah, he was. I just remember his racket speed and the spin getting on the ball. I was just like. This is not how you play grass court tennis, but I was still really good. Uh, it was still really good to watch him. 
Yeah. Well, Queens, yeah, Queens back in the day, they did used to let you in, uh, but they haven't been no. of late for the qualities. It used to be a nice freebie in London. Let's, but, uh, yeah, we'll let's let's hope that let's hope that changes the season. But we do have the clay swing to look forward to. The road to Roland Garros starts here. So, listeners, I hope you've enjoyed our latest episode of the Tennis Weekly podcast. Remember to subscribe to us to stay up to date on all the actions come from the ATP and WTA tours. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all major podcasting platforms out there. And if you like what you're hearing, then make sure to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can also follow us on social media or email the show. We're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube and X. Our handle is at Tennis Weekly Pod. You can also purchase Tennis Weekly merch on etsy.com slash shop slash Tennis Weekly Podcast. You can also email us tennisweeklypod at gmail.com. And don't forget to check out our website as well, tennisweekly.co.uk. And we will be back next week at Tennis Weekly HQ. So I hope you can join us for that. But in the meantime, it's goodbye from Kim. Goodbye. It's goodbye from Chris. And it's goodbye from me. We'll see you again soon.